Towards, Towards me? Okay. Good afternoon. For those of you who may not remember from two weeks ago or, or whom I never met, my name is Bob Rubin. And along with Jason Sheffield, who I think you all met, we represent Travis McMichael. This case is about duty and responsibility. I didn't want to interrupt you. I was trying to get your co-counsel, but if you could get, if you can close then you may wander. If we could try to get close to the microphone for the court reporter. Yes, sir. It's about Travis McMichael's duty and responsibility to himself, to his family, and to his neighborhood. And it's about your duty and responsibility as jurors. The state talked about actions based on assumptions. I'm going to talk about facts. Facts in this case. Travis McMichael is 35 years old. He's single. And he has a five-year-old son named Everett. From 2007 until 2016, Travis McMichael was in the United States Coast Guard. He was a boarding officer in the Coast Guard, which means he was authorized to make arrests. He was authorized to do investigations. He was authorized to do searches. He was authorized to use his weapon when appropriate. In order to become a boarding officer, he attended FLETC in Charleston, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. You all know that acronym. At FLETC, he took the training that allowed him to do the law enforcement activities that he did for 10 years or nine years. He learned how to do searches and seizures. He learned what probable cause was, a legal term that you'll hear more about. He learned how to use firearms in a safe, effective way. He learned how to use force in compliance with his training. The training he had was not just classroom training at FLETC. It is scenario-based training. It is repetitive training so that if you're ever in a real life situation where you need to make use of force decisions, you're relying not just thinking back, you're relying on muscle memory. Because those split seconds are often the difference between life and death. But not only did Travis McMichael get training at FLETC in all of these law enforcement activities, searches and seizures, investigations, report writing, use of firearms, use of force decision making. But every year he was in the Coast Guard, he had additional training. And every year in the Coast Guard, when he became efficient enough, he then became a trainer of the trainees. He was training the trainers. He was training his fellow Coast Guardsmen on the law enforcement activities, on how to be a boarding officer. After he left the Coast Guard, and in 2020, Travis was working for Mets and Marine as a coxswain. He's working at the naval base, moving boats around. He was living at home with his mom, Lee, and his father, Greg, his sister, Lindsay, and his uh, son, Everett, who was then three years old. He was living at home because the apartment he was living in previously had been sold by his landlord. So he needed to live back at home, save some money, so he could go back out on his own again. 
He was living, as the state told you earlier, in Satilla Shores. This is a low-tech map of Satilla Shores because I don't trust PowerPoint. You'll see a PowerPoint, but I don't trust it that much. So this is a regular map of it, Google Earth map. Highway 17 up here, Satilla Drive here, 230 Satilla Drive. This is just to act, acclimate you. This is Jones Road, and I know it's hard it's hard for all jurors maybe to see this, but you'll see this many times throughout the case. And we'll talk more about the rest of it. But he lived on Satilla, Satilla Drive in Satilla Shores. Satilla Shores is a quiet, scenic, middle-class neighborhood. The kind of neighborhood where parents let the kids ride around on their bikes the kind of neighborhood where when you're my age, you go for a walk after dinner. The kind of neighborhood that we all kind of aspire to live in. It's safe, it's beautiful, you work in the yard, you play on the river. This is the family and community that Travis McMichael felt a duty and responsibility to during the course of events in 2019 and 2020. This is the family and community that made him willing to put himself at risk to help the police detain Ahmaud Arbery. The video that you watched probably five times in the state's opening statement, doesn't even begin to tell the story in this case. It's like looking through that knot hole in the fence and thinking you see the whole baseball field when you really only see the outfield. The case really begins months before in 2019 because Satilla Shores was a neighborhood on edge. Crime had gone up. It wasn't violent crime. It was property crimes, the kind of crimes that are unsettling, the kind of crimes that are scary because you don't know who's coming onto your property, who's in your car ransacking it, who's breaking into your buildings, who's stealing your lawnmowers or your guns. And so the neighborhood was on edge. So much so that behaviors began to change by the neighbors. Kids were not allowed, some kids, to play outside after dark. Residents of Satilla Shores installed home surveillance cameras to catch the thieves that were taking their property. And neighbors in Satilla Shores felt a duty and responsibility to each other to post on the neighborhood pages, Facebook and Nextdoor, about the crime that was happening. And you'll hear about that. The types of posts that you saw on these pages includes, this is ridiculous. My daughter always freaks out. It's getting old. I'm nervous, lock your cars. These are actual posts from those, that neighborhood Facebook page. As a result of this uptick in crime, of people being on edge, people were alert to suspicious behavior. In July of 2019, Travis McMichael and Greg McMichael were alert to suspicious behavior long before ever encountering Ahmaud Arbery. In July of 2019, Travis McMichael, who was at that point running a little charter boat, taking people out, tourists out on the river, in the marshes, <clears throat> was on his boat with some guests when he went under the fancy Bluffs Bridge that you heard about earlier. There he saw a homeless man who had lots of stuff around him and a tarp. Stuff, the kind of stuff that made Travis look twice and made Travis feel suspicious that maybe this was the guy who was taking the stuff out of our neighborhood. So he dropped off his guests eventually, 
went home, got in the car with his father, Greg, and they drove to the area under the fancy Bluffs Bridge. There they saw the man. And what you see up here is the call, basically a, what's called a CAD report. It's basically a report made of Greg McMichael's 911 call to the Glen County Police to say, hey, basically, there's a guy under the bridge we think is responsible. Could you please investigate? And the police did. They sent an officer out there, and really nothing of note was found. And the investigation ended. But the break-ins, the theft, didn't end, especially for a man named Larry English. For Mr. English, it was only beginning. Larry English, as you heard, lives in Douglas, Georgia. He was so excited to have a weekend home in Satilla Shores on this be beautiful little Satilla River. He built a home. He was going to use it for weekends and vacations with his wife Amy, his daughter Laura, his son Hoyt. And so it took time, delays and all that with contractors and himself having issues with health. But he started building a home in Satilla Shores for use as a vacation place, a getaway. He built a dock. His home is right here, in the dock on the river. He had a boat on a hoist at the dock, and he had a large offshore boat in his RV garage. In that garage, and I promise not to touch the screen, is this large garage. But that's where he kept, it's called an RV, a garage, but it's really a boat garage for Mr. English. Eventually, because of some advice from his neighbor, Kenny Wade, who lived next door, he installed a camera at the dock and one on the back of his house, which you can't see from this photo. He was concerned about liability because kids were playing out there and they were, you know, they would take his scraps of wood, they would hang out by the dock, but he was also concerned about theft because he had valuables at his house. He had two boats, sometimes three boats, and he parked his camper on the property, which you can't see in the picture, but you'll see eventually. His camper that he stayed in, sometimes alone, sometimes with his wife and kids, when they came to the house either to work on it or to play at it. So he was concerned about all of this when he installed those cameras. Over the course of the next three, four months, he saw on his cameras at night Ahmad Arbery four times. The first time, and this is the first time his camera alerted at, uh, at all was October 25th, 2019. Now remember, he's in Douglas, Georgia. He has a cell phone. When his camera spots somebody, he gets an alert on his cell phone. This is a photograph of Ahmad Arbery on his dock, October 25th, 2019. He gets this alert. He sees this man. He calls Glen County Police Department. Can't call 911 because 911 would go to Douglas Police. But he calls the 911 number for Glen County Police. And he's scared. And he's concerned. What is this guy doing at my house at night? There is no legitimate reason, according to Mr. English, for this man to be at his house where his boats are stored, where his camper is, is parked at night. And he calls the police. He's concerned not only for his stuff, but he's concerned for his family. Because what if Amy was there at the camper alone? What if his daughter, Laura, was there sleeping there that night? And she walks outside and bumps into this intruder. And he gets scared, and he panics, and she panics, 
and something really, really awful happens. These are the thoughts that went through Larry English's mind when he sees this intruder in his house on October 25th, 2019. He calls back Glen County a second time after this initial call. Go back a little bit. Okay. Um, because he calls the police to tell them that the man who's on the dock, and he describes him as plundering around, describes his tattoos, describes his hair twists. The man who was in his house plundering around has now gone across the street towards his other neighbor's house. He describes it as a, I think, whitish, yellowish house. It's Subi Lawrence's house. It's a neighbor he knows. Subi is a single mom. She's a mother of three boys, the boys who play outside and ride their bikes and, and steal Larry English's scraps of wood for their skateboard ramp or their fort or whatever they're doing. This is who Mr. English sees and who he's concerned about. And he wants the police to, to, to confront this man and tell him, don't come back. He doesn't see him take anything. Remember, he's only got cameras on the back of the house right now. One camera, the back of the house, and one camera at the dock. He wants him removed. By the time police come, and I think it's Officer Rash who responds that first time. Robert Rash, and you'll hear from Officer Rash. No sign of Mr. Arbery, who is the man we later find out is Ahmad Arbery. No sign. Now he's okay with curiosity seekers coming to his house. We've all done it. You see a house under construction. It looks kind of interesting. Oh, what's, what are the neighbors building? What are they adding on? What's the staircase going to look like? He's okay with all that. He's okay with the kids coming in during the daytime, taking the scraps of wood. It didn't matter to him. What concerned him was there is no reason that's legitimate to be there at night. And that's why he calls the police. Sometime after October 25th, Mr. English is on a ladder in his RV garage, looks in his offshore boat, and realizes his satellite system, his Yeti cooler, and his microphone system are gone, taken out of the boat. He doesn't know who did it. He does know the HVAC guys were in that area installing some of the, some of the, um, not pipes, some of the system in there. He also knows the black male from October 25th was in there. And so he's suspicious. But what can he do? The next alert on his phone is November 17th. Okay, November 17th, a white couple comes on his property at night, 10 o'clock at night. They park out by the porta potty that you saw in the earlier picture. The man has his belt unbuckled. Odd. Comes in the house and he calls 911 and he says, about a week and a half to two weeks ago, I had my stuff stolen. This is now November 17th. Week and a half, two weeks ago is pretty close to October 25th. I've had my stuff stolen. They're in the same area. They're, they're, they're going around where the RV, where the boat is in the RV garage. Police send an officer out. Officers go out. The couple's gone. They see nothing. Mr. English is upset and he's frustrated. He has valuables stored at the house. <clears throat> Stuff has been stolen. Now two people have been seen on his cameras, three people, two white people and a black male. And so the next morning, November 18th, he goes and he gets his boat and he hauls it away. Figures, I just can't keep valuables in this house that's open 
but is owned by him with his valuables. And so he takes the boat away. That very night, November 18th, he sees the same black male he saw on October 25th. The man we now know is Ahmaud Arbery. He's back again. He's seen around the boat, not the big offshore boat, but the other boats. And according to Mr. English, he's plundering around again. He calls Glen County police again. Glen County police arrive again. And again, Mr. Arbery gets away without being confronted by the police. And Mr. English is frustrated, of course. He's so frustrated that the very next day, November 19th, these are all out of order, and this is why we don't use technology. All right, November 18th, 2019. This is the night he sees Ahmaud Arbery for the second time. There's somebody back on the property again tonight. Black man, not wearing a shirt, in late November, got tattoos on his arms and a pair of light colored shorts. He's wandering in the carport, looking in the boat, not the offshore boat, the smaller boat. The same guy that was here about a week and a half, two weeks ago, the day, night before, he's calling police saying, my stuff was stolen a week and a half, two weeks before. He kind of looks like he's up to no good. He's on three different people's cameras in the neighborhood. This is Larry English's 911 call on November 18, 2019. November 19th, the very next day, he has an exchange through text message with his two doors down neighbor, Diego Perez. Diego Perez is another person who believes it's his duty and responsibility to look out not just for himself, but for his neighbors. And so Diego has this conversation with Larry English. This is a printout from an extraction from Larry English's phone. So, and you'll see this in evidence. And it's out of order, the way it's printed out. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through it because the first exchange is from Larry English. He sends Diego Perez clips of the videos from the white couple on the 17th of November and the black male on the 18th of November. And he says to Diego Perez, who he just knows as Diego Satilla Shores, that's how he's in his phone. They're not friends, they're just neighbors, good neighbors. And he says to Diego, have you seen these people in the neighborhood? And Diego says, no, sir. I can't say I've ever seen them in the neighborhood, but I'll keep an eye out. I can respond in mere seconds, because he's only two doors down, with your permission. Larry English says, you have my permission. And Diego says, I may be able to intercept them or pen them up for the police. I may be able to intercept them or pen them up for the police. Diego Perez is taking it upon himself, if he can, to perform a citizen's arrest. I'm going to hold them until the police come. And Larry English's response to that, thank you. Because seconds count. Diego Perez knows it, Larry English now knows it because three times he's tried to catch his intruders and three times he's failed because the police just get there too late. As Diego Perez artfully put it, when seconds count, the police are minutes away. And so he needs the help of Diego Perez and other neighbors. Officer Rash who responds to these calls he canvasses the neighborhood. He's trying to catch this guy. And so he canvasses the neighborhood using stills from the video. Have you seen this guy? Do you know him? Can you help me help Larry English? 
and no one knows him. He's not jogging in the neighborhood. No one's ever seen him. The only time we see Ahmad Arbery in Satilla Shores is at night on these cameras. And remember, people have cameras in the neighborhood. If he was in there jogging in the daytime, you would see evidence of that. So November 19th, Diego Perez helps, offers to help. Officer Rash canvasses the neighborhood. He's still a mystery. He is at this point a scary mystery because he's plundering around Larry English's house and now everybody knows it. Officer Rash has canvassed the neighborhood. Larry English is talking to neighbors like Matt Albenzi, like Subi Lawrence, like his neighbor Diego and his wife, Brooke Perez. It's being posted on Facebook, on the neighborhood Facebook page. Word is out that stuff was stolen from Larry English's house, parked in his RV garage. Now, I want to be clear, in May, after Travis McMichael was arrested, Larry English realizes he doesn't really know when the stuff was stolen. It was back in Douglas. It was in the house on Satilla Drive. But what he was telling people in October, November, December, January, February 2020, is that the stuff was taken out of my boat, parked at my house on Satilla Drive. That's what the neighbors knew from Larry English and Officer Rash. He's back at the house, Ahmad Arbery, on December 17th. This is now the third time seen on camera at Larry English's house. He's at night. He has no legitimate reason for being there. And remember, although you're seeing him through infrared cameras, it is pitch black in that house. There is no light. There's no lights on, there's no light switch, no light bulbs. It is pitch dark. And on December 17th, the Mott Arbery is seen plundering around <clears throat> again, again in the area where the boats were located in that RV garage. Police are not called that night. There is no 911 call. Larry English can't remember why he didn't call police. He may have been sick and not seen this video until much later. And you saw the clip of the video with Ahmad Arbery walking outside the house, looking around again, and taking off into the neighborhood. And the question remains, was he out for a jog? 10 o'clock at night, December 17th, or was he doing something else? And we'll never know. But it sure does look suspicious. The next time he's seen in Larry English's house is February 11th, 2020. This is now the fourth time in the house. But this time is different. Because this time it's not Larry English who calls the police. It's Travis McMichael. The state got the facts a little bit wrong. So let me correct them. Travis McMichael was going out that night about 7.30 at night, it's dark, to get gas, fill up his car before the next day. He had to be at work early, so he was just gonna fill up his car that night so he wouldn't have to wake up so early in the morning the next day. On his way up the street, and he's at 2.30 Satilla, this is the exit up here, this is English's house. As he gets up here, he sees a figure dart across the street. And this figure, now he realizes it's a man, is lurking in the shadows 25 to 30 feet from the street, kind of 
staying in the shadows very furtively, catches Travis's attention. He has no idea who this is. He's never met Ahmad Arbery. But he sees this guy, and he sees this guy kind of running across the lawn. It's really the, initially the house next door, kind of a Spanish-style house. And he runs across the yard, and he hides behind that red porta potty that you saw in that photograph. Travis is like, this is not good. We know about a guy intruding in Larry English's house. And he stops his car and he kind of aims his headlights at the porta potty. And knowing there is no legitimate reason for this man to be there, he starts to get out of his car to ask him why he's there. Well, this guy steps out from the porta potty and he reaches with his left hand, I believe into his waist, as if reaching for a weapon. This scares the heck out of Travis. He sees this, he's, he's trying to get out, gets in his car, puts it in reverse, stalls, because he's so startled, eventually backs up and gets home, where he calls 911, and this is what he says. This is the 911 call. We're not gonna play the whole thing because it's too long. about three or four minutes later, so we don't need to waste your time, is we've been having a lot of burglaries and break-ins around here lately. So now here we are, this guy who has seen Travis see him and seen Travis drive away, still has the audacity, the brazenness to go into the English house. Travis is home calling 911. Greg McMichael overhears and he starts going up to the English house. And he's got his firearm with him. And Travis says, whoa, 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 slow down. Turns out Travis ends up going up there with him and Travis has his firearm. Diego Perez, who by now has been alerted by Larry English with his video clips, he goes out there, he's armed. These neighbors are going to Larry English's house not because it's fun at eight o'clock at night in February in Satilla Shores, but because it's their duty and responsibility to each other to protect each other, to do what they can to help the police stop the guy 
who's plundering around, breaking into Larry English's house. Officer Rash gets called. They are all out. Officer Rash, two other officers, Diego Perez, Greg McMichael, Travis McMichael, all out trying to find the guy, Ahmad Arbery, who's now for the fourth time in Larry English's house. Officer Rash appreciates the help. He never tells Greg McMichael, Travis McMichael, or Diego Perez, hey guys, let the police handle this. We got this. No problem. You guys go home. He never tells them, hey, put those guns away. We don't need guns out here. Don't carry guns around here. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, no, you guys cannot stop and detain this guy if you catch him. That's a police job because it is a citizen's job to help the police. And the law authorizes that. He tells Greg McMichael and Travis McMichael that Larry English says nothing was stolen, but these guys know stuff was stolen. Everybody knows it. Larry English has already told everybody. Subi, Matt, Diego, Brooke, Annette Beasley, Ronnie Olson, Rash has been around. We all know it. Stuff has been stolen. So now here we are. Here are facts, not assumptions. Travis McMichael has now seen Ahmad Arbery face to face for the first time. In Larry, at Larry English's house and then in Larry English's house. He's had a first hand encounter. He knows that Ahmad Arbery has been lurking around that house for no legitimate reason. Not authorized to be there. He's not working on the house, not doing anything but plundering around the house. He knows stuff has been stolen. It's, it's not, it's probably the power. These things have a mind of their own. I just want to make sure. He knows stuff has been stolen because Larry English has told everybody that. He knows this guy has the audacity to go in the house despite knowing people are around and watching him. He knows he's possibly armed because he made that move to his left-hand pocket, waist. <coughs> he has probable cause to believe a burglary has been committed. What is burglary? Let's go back one slide. Burglary is entering a dwelling, whether occupied or not. The fact that it's open without doors means nothing. It's any dwelling, any building, structure, whether occupied or not, without authority, with the intent to commit a felony or theft. You don't actually, to commit a burglary, have to take anything. It is the intent to take something or to commit another felony that makes it a burglary. Travis McMichael has probable cause, based on his training of what probable cause is, to believe Ahmad Arbery is a burglar. Probable cause. What does it mean? It is the level of suspicion. Objection. At this point in time, this is. I have an objection at this point in time to this being the law, and the law is going to come from the court. And this has not been. How about, how about I put this? Approved on any level by the court. Well, let me make it clear. This is what Travis McMichael understood from his training was the definition of probable cause. Okay. So the Just evidence for sure. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, as I indicated to you, the court will actually charge you on the law. During the presentation here, uh, the representation is made on what the law is. Again, the court, you will, you will receive that from the court. You will not be receiving that from counsel. So if we could please couch the argument in those terms. Yes, sir. And this is not what I understand probable cause to be. This is what Travis McMichael from his 10 years in the Coast Guard understands probable cause to be. The level of suspicion that would cause a reasonable and prudent person to believe that a crime has been committed under the t totality of the circumstances. That's it. 
It's the level of suspicion that you would need under the totality of the circumstances to believe that a crime was committed. That's where Travis McMichael sat as of February 11th, 2020. The next time we see Ahmaud Arbery in Satilla Shores is February 23rd. It's a beautiful day, kind of a warm February day in Brunswick. Travis McMichael, around midday, around one o'clock, is on the couch in his living room trying to get Everett to take a nap, three-year-old son. <clears throat> so he's doing the strategies that parents do. He has Everett every other week. He shares custody with Everett's mom. On this Sunday, he's trying to get Everett to go to sleep. Greg is in the front yard in the driveway, reupholstering his boat cushions. It is a pleasant, uneventful Sunday morning leading into Sunday afternoon. While they're doing that, Ahmad Arbery is walking into the neighborhood, not jogging, not running, walking into the neighborhood, walking into Larry English's front yard. Next. <clears throat> where he stands there, and this is the view from Ronnie Olson's house across the street, where he stands there looks around and walks into the house. While he's doing that, Matt Albenzi is in his yard down Jones. He's down here. He can see directly into Larry English's yard. He is aware of the break-ins into Larry English's house. He is aware of the items stolen from Larry English's boat. He's out splitting logs tree had fallen in his yard, so he's breaking up the tree. He sees this guy that looks like the guy from the video clips, in fact, is the guy from the video clips, walking into Larry Inks' house. He grabs his gun, puts it in his pocket, grabs his cell phone, walks down Jones to an oak tree, there he is, across the street from Larry Inks' house, and he calls 911. While he's calling 911, he sees Ahmad Arbery through the windows in Larry English's house. He doesn't know what he's doing in there, but he knows this guy's been there at night four times prior. He knows stuff is stolen, so he's calling the police. He makes, he believes, eye contact with Ahmad Arbery. The next thing he sees is Ahmad Arbery sprint out of that house. He is not jogging. He is running away into the neighborhood, possibly armed, based on prior experience. He is sprinting at what turns out to be about a six minute mile. It's fast and he's got long strides. That view is from Diego Perez's surveillance camera. He runs right past Greg McMichael's yard. Greg McMichael sees him. Greg McMichael is aware of the things that have happened that we've talked about. Greg McMichael sees him tearing, hauling ass down the road. And he knows what's up. And he goes inside and he tells Travis, Travis, the guy, the guy's running down the street. The guy, they know who it is. They're not guessing. It's not some random guy running down the street. It's the guy. And they turn out to be right. It is the guy, the same guy, four previous times at night. They grab their guns. Now, why did Travis McMichael grab his shotgun? Because 12 days earlier, he confronts this guy, trying to help Larry English, and this guy reaches into his pocket like he has a gun. So he grabs his shotgun for self-protection. And he gets in the car, and he walks out in the yard, actually, 
and he sees Matt Albenzi motioning down the street. Same direction Ahmad Arbery was running in. So he gets in the car, his dad gets in the, in the truck, I'm sorry, I say car, it's a truck, Ford F-150, and climbs into the car seat because when seconds count, the police are often minutes away. The police are not going to catch this guy at the speed he's running. So they're going to try to detain him for the police. What happens after that is up to the police. So they encounter Ahmad Arbery on Burford. The first encounter is at 307 Burford. This is what it looks like. You saw the uh, video. Oh, let's, uh, let's go back to there. They're there to detain Ahmad Arbery for the police. This is what the law allows. A private person may arrest an offender if the offense is committed in his presence or immediate knowledge. And that applies to felonies or misdemeanors. But there's a second sentence the state didn't tell you about. The second sentence is, if the offense is a felony and the offender is escaping or attempting to escape, a private person may arrest him upon reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion. That's why Travis McMichael and Greg McMichael sought to detain him at Arbery. It, there was no crime committed in their presence. We're not contending there was a crime committed in their presence. But there was probable cause to believe a felony had been committed and that this man was attempting to escape or flee. That's why citizen's arrest is in this case. There are three encounters with Ahmad Arbery on Burford. The first one is in front of Roddy Brian's house, William R. Brian. I shouldn't call him Roddy. I don't know. Mr. Brian's house. <clears throat> Travis McMichael pulls up alongside Ahmad Arbery and says, Stop. Whoa. I want to talk to you. What were you doing back there? What's going on? And Ar Ahmad Arbery says, Zero. He doesn't say, Hey, man, I'm just out for a jog. He doesn't say, Hey, leave me alone. He doesn't say, Back off. He doesn't say, Hey, calm. Doesn't say anything. He just looks at Travis, and he goes back the other way. Travis backs his truck up. He says, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! Stop! I'm gonna talk to you." Ahmad Arbery looks at him, and bolts. Doesn't say anything. Doesn't say, "Leave me alone." Doesn't say, "Hey, good morning, good afternoon." He just bolts. At this time, there is no gun. The shotgun that Travis bought is, is, is stuck between his seats. Greg's gun is on his holster. There's no gun being pointed at Mr. Arbery. There's no like, hey, stop at the point of a pistol or a, or a shotgun. There's no gun. Mr. Arbery's not even aware of any gun at that point because no gun has been shown. They go down Burford. They r pull up to him again in Burford, by the way, Till the drive turns kind of the little jog turns into Burford. And they go down Burford a little ways more. Whoa, stop. We want to talk to you. Stop. The, we called the police. Police are coming. When Mr. Arbery hears Travis McMichael say, We called the police, police are coming, he bolts back the other way towards Roddy Bryant's house, back towards. Drive. They stop the truck, put it in park. Greg McMichael does get out and he gets in the bed because he's cramped into the child seat. Travis McMichael gets out and he looks down the road like, what the heck? I want to talk to this guy. He's just been suspected of coming out of English's house. He sees Al Benzi moving. We know it's the guy from the night uh, 12 days before. He's back again. And he looks down the street and he sees Ahmad Arbery trying to 
get into Roddy Bryan's truck, to Mr. Bryan's truck. He's interacting with the truck. And he doesn't know who that black Silverado <coughs> truck is, belongs to. He doesn't know Roddy Bryan. He's never met him. He doesn't know his truck. So he sees this black Silverado, and he sees a Mott Arbery trying to get in it, and he expects to hear a gunshot because he thinks a Mott Arbery is armed, like he pretended to be on the 11th, and he's fearful that this guy, whose name he doesn't know, will try to shoot the owner of the truck and take the truck. And so that scares him. This attacking the truck worries him. His dad says, Travis, go back, go back. He says, no, Dad, let's go around. We're going to go around Zellwood. You've heard the name. It goes down further down here. They see this interaction back here. They're going to go around Zellwood. They don't, they're going to take a left on Holmes. Now, they don't know where either the Black Silverado is or what that has to do with anything or where Ahmad Arbery is. So going down, Zell, uh, going down Holmes is not with the intention of, of trapping Ahmad Arbery. It's with the intention of strategically planting yourself so you can kind of help the police see the neighborhood. As they go down Holmes Drive at a slow rate, they see Ahmad Arbery running in front of the truck. Travis McMichael drives past him, doesn't say anything to Ahmad Arbery, doesn't shout at him, just kind of drives past him, watching to see what this guy is going to do. Again, no gun, no shotgun, no pistol, is brandished, pointed, in any way shown to Mr. Arbery. Three times on Burford, they encountered Mr. Arbery. Now, once on Holmes, no gun. They go down to the bottom of Holmes, towards the stop sign, and stop the car. They don't know where Mr. Arbery is at this point because he's around a dog leg. That's the picture of Holmes Drive. Looking up it from Travis McMichael's vantage, and you can see where the road kind of dog legs to the right. And past that dog leg, you can't see what's happening. But at that point, Travis McMichael can now strategically see Satilla Drive, his road where his family is located, Burford, and Holmes. So if the police get there, which he thinks they're coming any minute, he can tell them, I don't see him in these directions, he's that way. Or I do see him, and he's in one of these streets. That's why he stops. While he stopped there, gets out of his truck, Greg is still in the bed, and they see Ahmad Arbery coming at him. And Travis is like, whoa, stop, stop, whoa, 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 stop. And Ahmad Arbery keeps running at him. Travis keeps yelling, stop, stop, stop. And then he reaches into his car, and he sees Ahmad Arbery flip and go back around the dog leg. Travis is gone and his cell phone. He says, Dad, when are the police getting here? He says, I didn't call 911. Travis dials 911 and gives his dad his phone. And that's why we have a 911 call, because Travis McMichael had his phone and thought to call the police. Where are they? It's before the first shot is fired, they call the police. That is not evidence of an intent to murder. While Travis is out there, now he has his gun for protection because this guy has run at him, has acted bizarrely, has not said a word yet that he could tell. And now Ahmad Arbery is running back. Travis's training taught him to show a weapon. Not to use a weapon, to show a weapon, because that is a way to de-escalate violence. In the normal situation, you show someone you have a weapon, you get compliance. You don't need to go any further. And so he stands there at the low ready position, not pointing his weapon, and Ahmad Arbery is running. And he's running at Travis McMichael. 
stop, stop, get down, stop. And this guy's not stopping. And Travis knows that this guy is not going to stop. He's not predictable. He's going to be on him in seconds if he doesn't do something. It's like, please, please turn. Please go up, Satilla. This is where we are. Ahmad Arbery had a clear path to Satilla. Travis is down here. He could have cut across there. He doesn't cut across. He's coming at him. And yes, at about 20 yards, he raises the weapon because he knows Ahmad Arbery can be on him and he's hoping that by raising the weapon, he will de-escalate the situation. Who's going to attack a guy pointing a shotgun? If he wanted to kill him, that was an open shot. He didn't shoot. He didn't shoot his weapon. He was trying to de-escalate the situation in compliance with his nine years of training in the Coast Guard, same training police officers get. You see his, let's go back to the um, one before. <clears throat> the gun is down, and you saw this a little bit. You can see the, the, the white forearm of Travis McMichael. Let me move this map. <clears throat> I apologize. <laughs> Turn this to give them a better look at it. Um, it's okay. Be careful. It doesn't even face them. How can we not turn it? It's on wheels. I, I didn't say don't. Okay. I said be careful because when we've done that before, we have lost. You'll see this in okay, the hold, hold on. Hold on oh, a second. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Next time I ask you to stop, please stop. Oh, I'm, I okay. thought you should just be careful. No, I just, yeah, the point is let's not keep moving stuff around. I just, if you're going to be doing something, just let everybody know what's going on. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, the point was last time this was touched, not by Ms. Donkowski, but generally in other matters before the court, we've lost it. So if we could, before we just start moving things around, let the court know. I don't touch it. I, well, I know Mr. Rubin doesn't <laughs> I'm touch not it. not touching it. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I don't mean to call it Mr. Chef, but I, I just, I, I'm very touchy about, no pun, no, no pun intended, uh, about some of this electronics in here, as Mr. Rubin has alluded to, we've lost connections and all sorts of problems. So we're trying to make sure these presentations flow. So I, I didn't mean to get on council. But if everybody could let me know if we're doing that. This is a fuzzy picture. You'll have, you'll have pictures in, this, in the video <clears throat> throughout the course of the trial. His, his, his arm is down, and you can see the white forearm. You can see the driveway here. Travis McMichael. We haven't lost the sight line there, have we? You're okay over your shoulder now? Okay, that, that's the other issue. Is... And I know it's awkward, yeah. Yeah, we, okay. Speak loud. Sorry. <clears throat> so there's a driveway here, and Travis McMichael is across from another driveway. You'll see it's about 60 feet, 20 yards away. And he knows how quickly someone can cover 20 yards in seconds an unarmed person can take a weapon away and kill a police officer or a civilian in seconds, even from 20 yards away. Even an armed person from 20 yards away. So he raises his weapon in the next slide. And you see the distance because he wants the guy to stop, not because he wants to hurt Ahmad Arbery. He's not looking for an encounter. If he wanted to hurt somebody, he would have fired on Burford, on Holmes, or now down here at the bottom. Ahmad Arbery doesn't stop. He doesn't say, whoa, hey, I'm good. He doesn't say anything. And he doesn't stop. Instead, he goes around the truck to the right-hand side, the passenger side, and at that point, Travis McMichael can't see his hands. Remember, he still thinks this guy could be armed because I saw this guy, at least pretend he was, on the 11th. He doesn't know, and he can't see his hands. And his dad, his 64, 65-year-old dad, <clears throat> who's had a stroke, is on the bed, and Ahmad Arbery could just yank him down or take a shot at him. He doesn't know. So he goes to the front of the truck to get an eye on him. What's this guy going to do? 
Good Lord, I hope he just keeps running. Go up Satilla. But he doesn't know, so he goes to the front, and within a split second, Ahmad Arbery makes a left, not a right. Makes a left and is on Travis, such that Travis has no choice but to fire his weapon in self-defense. And that shot is a contact or near contact wound, meaning Ahmad Arbery is on him. And you will hear that from Brian Leppard of the GBI Crime Lab. That first shot, which we can't really see because it's videotaped through two windshields, Robbie Bryan's windshield and Travis McMichael's windshield, they're in front of the truck. When they collide, when Ahmad Arbery makes a left, he's on Travis and Travis has to fire. Because at that point, it's his life or Ahmad Arbery's life. And the only thing, it's weird the way the mind works, the only thing he can think of at that point is Everett. It kind of flashes through his mind. My three, then three-year-old son. So he fires, he pulls down the weapon, trying to get it away, because Ahmad Arbery's not stopped. That gunshot, which he knows was near his chest, at least he believes it, in this, in this melee, he pulls it down, he pulls it back. You'll see from the video, he goes backwards out of frame, because Arbery is rushing him, pulls it down, he fires another shot off frame. You see smoke, you see something spray. And you see Ahmad Arbery swinging wildly. And he's hitting Travis. You see him hit with his right hand into Travis's head, neck. He is pounding Travis McMichael while Travis is trying to get the gun away. And Travis fires two more times, and you've seen that. It's a horrible, horrible video. And it's tragic. It's tragic that Ahmad Arbery lost his life. But at that point, Travis McMichael is acting in self-defense. He did not want to encounter Ahmad Arbery physically. He was only trying to stop him for the police. <clears throat> self-defense is defined And the court will charge you later. Your Honor, I'm objecting again. Mr. Rubin is now giving them the law in self-defense. It is. So. We, we are allowed to give a law in opening statement, just as the state did in its opening statement. We need to be very clear, because, again, we haven't gone through a charge conference in this case. So let's be clear about it, that this is not the charge. Okay. So I expect we'll, you'll be charged on self-defense. And I expect this is what you'll be called, be charged, be told by the judge. A person is justified in using force which is intended or likely to cause death or great bodily harm only if he reasonably believes that such force is necessary to prevent death or great bodily injury to himself or to a third person. At the time the shots are fired, <clears throat> Travis McMichael reasonably believes because Ahmad Arbery is on him, aggressively, swinging wildly, grabbing hold of him, grabbing hold of the gun, reasonably believes he is justified in firing his weapon, knowing it's gonna, it's gonna kill him, it's gonna at least hurt him. He knows that. But he has no choice because if this guy gets his gun, he's dead, or his dad's dead. And what's he taught in the Coast Guard at the Maritime Law Enforcement Academy? Never lose your weapon. And that's why he shoots. Travis McMichael, within seconds, encounters the police. Officer Minshew, Officer Duggan, they arrive on scene, he cooperates fully. He does whatever they tell him to do. When they say speak, he speaks. When they say don't speak, he doesn't speak. He cooperates fully, he's distraught, he's upset. 
You'll see this on the video, the body cam of the officers. There's no glee at having done what he just did. It's awful. He's covered in blood, Ahmaud Arbery's blood. And then they take him down to the station and he cooperates fully with the police and answers every question. When they tell him to write a map of where he went, he tries to write a map of where they went when they encountered each other on Burford and, and, and Holmes. And when they ask him to write a statement, he does his best to write out everything he knows to tell the police. <clears throat> There's been a lot written about this case and Travis McMichael's actions. <clears throat> Doesn't matter. What matters now is the evidence that you're going to hear, the facts that you're going to hear, and the law that you're going to be given by Judge Walmsley. You are now the judges of the facts and the applicators of the law in this case. The evidence shows overwhelmingly that Travis McMichael honestly and lawfully attempted to detain Ahmaud Arbery according to the law and shot and killed him in self-defense. What we're asking you to do is hard, and it may be unpopular, but we're asking you to recognize your responsibility as jurors in being open to the facts and putting aside emotion and listening to the law and applying that and doing your duty, because we think the only right verdict is not guilty on each and every count in this indictment. Thank you.